Welcome to today's episode of the Group X Podcast. I'm your host, Tony Zanato. If you're enjoying the podcast and would like to show you support, then head on over to the website and click on the Patreon link to find out how to become a show supporter. Today, I'll be talking to Jackie Fury, trainer and presenter for Les Mills Asia Pacific. Be you! Jackie and I talk about what it takes to be you and the importance of being you. So grab your favourite beverage, sit back and enjoy the show. Jackie, welcome to the Group X podcast. It's so good to see you. Thank you, Tony. Thank you very much for um, asking me to come on and uh, have a chat with you. No, I'm re- really looking forward to getting to know you a little bit better than I do, and uh, I'm sure the listeners are as well. So, hey, I, I where so. <laughs> where does your where does your journey begin? How did you get into the industry? Oh gosh, um, how long have we got? The <laughs> <laughs> uh, fitness industry in general. Yeah. Um, gosh, okay, so we're going to go a ways back. Um, I guess, you know, I was always into sports in school. Um, I was born and bred in South Africa, um, so I was a very active kid and uh, participated in all sorts of sports and all that, and um, uh, moved to London in my, oh gosh, I was probably about 19, I think it was, um, and did a two-year traveling, working at Visa, and In the process of that, I met my partner at the time, and um, we we well decided that we wanted to carry on living in London, right? So after the two-year visa, you have to apply for different visas to carry on staying over there. And um, so it went from two years to three years to four years, and then in that process, uh, we got a de facto uh, visa at the time. Uh, we changed jobs a few times during that space of time. So I was originally a bartender. Uh, I loved doing that job. So yeah, yep. there was uh, lots of stories from that from that era. <laughs> yes, <yep>. um, <laughs> uh, so when we decided we had to sort of move on and be a bit more um, grown up, uh, moved into different areas. So he moved into, uh, I think it was actually, it was Fitness First straight up uh, and we went into gym management there. Yep. Uh, and during that process, for me to keep uh, onto my visa as well, I had to do like a study visa as well. So it was a, I can't remember what it was called. Anyway, so I was doing some computer courses and stuff on the side. And this particular, um, what do you want to call it, facility where I was doing these courses, there was a gym across the road and that happened to be Fitness First. Yep. Um, yep. So that got me, because he was managing the gym sort of not too far away from where I was, I was able to get in there on a membership and uh that started with my going to the gym and, yep. and, and training. And, yep. um, you know, I loved it, obviously, because I've always been sports-specific in South Africa, yep. and I loved that I had dabbled in the gym as well over there. And I just really wanted to get more into the fitness side of things because I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Yep. I hated what I was doing, and I was doing it to basically – it was just a means to get by, get through the visa, yeah. you know, yep. stay in the country sort of thing. So. Yep. Um, computer, Microsoft coding, that was not, that's not yep. me. <laughs> this is not me. Um, so that actually really helped me find my passion. And yeah. I knew that's, that's, that's what I wanted to do. So, you know, everything happens for a reason, right? So yeah. that actually led me into that side of things. And, um, I took the initiative to, to, to start training up in, in PT. So, you yeah. know, gym instructor, all yeah. that. Um, and that led me down to the PT side of things. So that was, yeah, many, many years ago and it's never stopped. Yep. Um, we didn't have group fitness at that gym. It was a, a fitness first, um, on Carnaby street in London. You know, most of the gyms there are all underground. Yes. So majority of them. Yeah. yeah. So there's no, there's no, you leave for work in the dark, you work in a dungeon yep. and you leave back <laughs> in the dark. <laughs> so yes. there's, it's like, yep. where's the natural light in these places? Yeah. You know? Um, it can mess with your brain actually a little bit. So, yeah. um, yeah, it's, I was not predisposed to, to group fitness back then. Some of the other gyms had that, but yeah, I had no idea. So it was more when we moved here. Um, and that was about 15 years ago now. Yep. So when we first moved here, we actually transferred with Fitness First. Yep. Um, so that was, yeah. So he came into manage one of the Fitness First in St. Kilda. And so that's where we started off. And that's where I continued to go to the gym. And um, 
met one of my and still really good friends, Justine, Justine Sutala. So yeah, yeah. she introduced me to uh, group fitness <laughs> to cycle. So it was RPM. Yeah. Um, and she tried for the longest time to get me to come into one of her classes. And I just, I just couldn't get my head around the whole idea. You know, yeah. it just, just, it just didn't make sense to me, you know. <laughs> I, yeah, I just didn't know what it was all about. So yeah. eventually, eventually, um, the one day she said, "Just come and do my class." I was like, "All oh, right, okay." I wasn't dressed for the occasion back then. I was, <laughs> you know, I had these Lululemon, I think, yoga pants on that were flared at the bottom, and whatever I had on top, and <laughs> runners. <laughs> so I had to roll up these pants so that I could actually sit my feet into the cages correctly. Yeah. Uh, and 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 yeah, and I had no idea what I was in for, and yeah, that was. I have not forgotten that class. Like I said, that was probably about 15, 16 years ago. How long yep. it was? Yeah. Um, I hated it. Yeah. <laughs> I was about to say to you, what, what did you think of it after you did it? What did you think? <laughs> but I absolutely loved it at yep. the same time. It yep. was just, I was just blown away. I was like, oh my God, okay, so this is what it's all about. And what really drew me into it was the music. Yeah. You know, the music. Yeah. You know, um, it was everything, you know, I was a little brave bunny back in the days, you know, living in London, did yeah. all that. So, yeah. you know, uh, it was hearing all those tunes and feeling that vibe, but in a completely different manner. It yeah. was just, wow. So you can train to this stuff and, yeah. and get that sort of really cool, happy high. That endorphin hit. From, yeah. 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 Um, so it was just, I, I think I knew from that point deep down, I was just like, I want to do this. Yeah. Like, I want to do this, Excellent. you know. Um, you got the bug. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yep. So it took a, it took, it took a few more classes, and um, you know, uh, I would I wouldn't hide away in the back either. I would sit up in the front, yeah. you know, so she could yell at me, and because <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I love that. So <laughs> yeah, it's that's kind of how it all started. Yeah. The music fifteen years ago as well would have uh, from from those that are in our age bracket, it it uh, it's very different to the music of today. Uh, not saying the music of today is bad, but the music back then fifteen years ago was very, yeah. You'd walk into a cycle or a, a an RPM class and you would be transported to back to the nightclub where you'd probably spent your weekend or or, or you had previously spent many weekends in in a, in you know, a couple of years prior, and the the music just got you going and. and for our listeners out there, uh, Jackie and I just listened to uh, to track seven of the latest um, RPM before we hit play or before we hit record this morning. And, yeah, that first minute and a half build up and then when it actually drops, both of us sat, sat here and, and had the goosebump moment of going, and yes. And then the head goes. That, yes, yes, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's what it's about. And, yeah, I'll honestly say the music 15 years ago was, <clears throat> was the same as that feeling, that, that exact same thing. So I get where... Where the um the bug or where you where you sort of found that passion to so yeah I want to do this I want to want to teach and have some fun awesome yeah, yeah, awesome yeah uh, and when you also before you mentioned about you know working in bar and that kind of stuff I did nightclub security for uh, a good seven years and um yeah I can that's, see that, that <laughs> that's where uh, what are you saying is it is it my size or is it yeah well, no no, <laughs> it's no. Your beautiful personality yeah. <laughs> <laughs> points for Jackie write that down <laughs> no um I did nightclub security for for many many years um for five six years whatever and it was that was really that was all before I started teaching and that was where my passion for music really came about I mean listening you know standing on a dance floor in the corner somewhere making sure people weren't fighting or, or doing the right stuff and that um yeah music is is music is key to what we do especially in group x it really makes a big difference and that's um i think where as well my passion started when i first walked into an rpm class as well to hear the music and went oh wow that was something that i really loved doing over there you mean i can listen to the music over here get paid to train people and train myself at sign me up yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready to go. Let's do this. So, um, yeah, a nice thing. So, hey, where, when did you do your, your training for RPM? What, um, where, where was that, and, and who was your initial um, module trainer? It was here um, in in Melbourne. <clears throat> Excuse me. Obviously, um, when it was, oh gosh, I think the actual training was about. Oh, I don't want to get it wrong. Fourteen years ago, because yeah, I sort of did. You know, it was a few months. Uh, I was doing the classes, yep. and it was. I think it was pretty much the next module that came up 
um, I was like, yep, you know, let's go for it. So it was, yep. it was actually with um, the legend, Lee Smith. Yep. So, yep. And, <laughs> Don't um, say that about him. You'll, you'll, you'll just, oh, God, here we go again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm super grateful and honoured to have had him as my as my trainer. It was a, it was a brilliant weekend. Uh, Justine was sitting in on that weekend as well um, yep. to assist with the, with the looking on the training side of things. Yeah. Um, so it was great to be able to spend the weekend, you know, with her there and, and, and just all these like-minded people. I hated my track. Yeah. Uh, this was not my, it was a track four. Yeah. And, um, what, I didn't like track fours. What you know, track was, I was it? was all about the, oh gosh, I knew you were going to ask me and I should have <laughs> brought out my DVD <laughs> because what was it? Um, I'll see if I can think of it, you know, whilst we're talking. That's but right. I what, it was what some release, release, what release uh, was 40. It? Okay. Yeah. So, uh, oh my gosh, it's a really slow one too. It's a really beautiful piece of music, yep. and I really appreciate it now. Yep. Um, but back then, yeah, you know, you know, I was all about the threes and sevens yep. and the six. Yeah. You know, those, yep. those were my tracks. Um, <laughs> I thrived on them, and I desperately wanted track three, which was Zombie. I still absolutely love that track. Uh, come back to it every now and then, you know, where I can. And um, but yeah, so. It, that, that was a challenge, I think, from the get-go. And you know what? I've actually been, I want to say coast, but I'm not going to say coast. I'm going to say challenged yep. uh, with uh, track fours throughout most of my trainings. <laughs> so when it came to my aim ones and aim twos and advanced training, same things, you know, same tracks. I'm like, yep. really? Why? You know, did they put a note going, yep, let's just keep giving it's- her track four. <laughs> 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 This is the Group X Podcast. How did you find initial module training? Uh, yeah, it was it was it was great. You know, it was challenging. It was nerve wracking because it was the first time I I was doing anything like that. Um, being in that environment, I was so nervous too. I was so incredibly nervous. You know, I was I was um, a little bit sort of reserved. You know, a bit, a bit shy as well. So I yep. think. We all, well, I think I still am, you know, I think we're all introverted, extroverts, extroverted, yeah. introverts, you know, all yep. that because we've got a bit of all of that in all of us. But, yeah, I was very nervous. I was really, really nervous and having to actually get up and um, present something to, yep. to not just, you know, Lee, but, but you know, in front of other people. Yeah. And that was my first experience of actually having to do that. You know, it was one thing sitting in a class and, uh, enjoying the ride and, and letting someone take the show and yep. then suddenly the, the, the spotlight's put onto you. you. Yeah. Um, so I was, yeah, I remember being incredibly nervous, uh, really excited, um, but then also really challenged because I was given that track and I thought, you know, if I could get, get given track three or seven, which were my favourites, or even six, I think that was Ecuador, um, I knew that I would be able to probably deliver it more authentically. Yep. So... Yeah, it was, uh, and I remember I had to go through, um, I had to do that track over and over again. As you know, it's a initial, initial module training. It was just relentless, and I was so over it by the end of it. I was just like, oh, you know, I just want, to, I just want to get through this training and just know that I can do it. But yeah, yeah so it, it really was a, a very challenging, um, but enjoyable, memorable experience. Yeah. Uh, particularly that, uh, what did they call it? The ride the. The race, the, of, of truth, the race it? of truth. What's it? Yeah, that's yeah. the one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, when we used to do that still. Yeah. Um, that was uh, that was quite uh, memorable. Yeah, <laughs> that's <laughs> a challenge. Thought, oh, okay, well, there's RPM and then there's this, and I yep. just remember thinking, wow, because the fitness was so different back then as well. You yep. know, I wasn't quite, you know, I wasn't anywhere near where I am now, yep. and um, having to ride that, I just I thought I was going to die. Yeah. So I think that was the whole purpose, wasn't yeah. it, really? <laughs> True. Uh, it's, it's, are you fit enough for this program? We're going to see. Let's exactly. Go. <laughs> and that's what it made you feel like. It's like, oh, man, am I? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. No, but love loved the whole experience. Yeah. yeah. I'll be, I'll be really honest crazy. and say to you now, I I think when we get given a track that isn't in our comfort zone, like you were given track four, yeah, it pushes us to – you're well out of your comfort zone, but it pushes us to learn – in a different way. You know, if you were given track three or track seven or track six, whatever it was, and you nailed it, it's great. But if you get given a track like you were given that doesn't sit where you sit, it challenges you to learn differently and challenges you to really mm. focus on on what your, I don't like the word weaknesses because I, it's, let's just say they're non-strengths. 
it means the same yeah. thing, but I'll say it in a different way. Yeah. But it, nice way. it allows you to focus on those those things differently to hone in on the skills that you need to hone in on. Yeah. And I think that for me, when I did, you know, the listeners know when I did mine was RPM 23 and track five for heart fifth, farter, farter, faster, harder, scooter, <laughs> <laughs> faster, harder, scooter. And, and I'd never done anything like this before. I'd walked in from telecommunications, you know, sitting in an office talking telco and IT stuff to people and, and walked into this environment and it was so foreign, but it makes you learn in a different way. For me, it was it was very much, wow, okay, what is this? Okay, they want me to do this. In the same way, I probably could have done a track three or a track seven and I probably would have nailed it, but I'm grateful that I got given a harder track, a different style to what fits with me naturally. Weirdly enough now, track five is my my track. You know, when I, when I go and do, when I go and do a, a class, I really get into the interval training. That is track five because I nail it. I know yeah. what it takes to go there with it now, and I, I really appreciate that. So I think it's great that, that you were given that track four and it, it pushed you out of your comfort zone to actually learn mm-hmm. a different style and learn a different way. I, I don't know. I haven't seen you teach, but I wouldn't be surprised now if track four is one of your strengths when you're teaching yeah. along with the three and the seven, you know, that kind of stuff, because you spent that time honing in on those skills to get it right, right from the beginning. And there's stuff you, you never, yeah. never forget. It's it's been a um, it's been a long sort of journey and process through all of it, um, you know, which which will probably come up with different types of training that's involved in, in with Les Mills. Um, I can honestly say after that, you know, I still hated track falls. Yep. I, <laughs> it was pretty much most of the releases that came. I was like, oh my god, track Another. falls, yeah. all me to sleep. You know, it's just like. <laughs> I'm so bad that I'm saying that, isn't it? <laughs> um, I'm just honest. <laughs> no, look, that's and that's that's. Uh, I think listeners appreciate that as well. There's not not everyone's going to gel with every single track, you know. I, I'm going to share a little story with you, and I don't know if I've shared this yet with anybody. But back in in I think it was 2010 or 2011, we had a Philex or a big quarterly workshop in Sydney, and Glenn and Sarah were over, and it was just around the time I believe when uh, Glenn had sort of really gotten into being the presenter and being the head program coach for RPM was standing in line getting a coffee and they were in front of me and um they turned around because we were in all sweaty gear after the class and everything turned around said I say how was that I said shit (laughs) (laughs) and 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 I look I'm I'm honest yeah I'm an honest person I can't I can't bullshit you know if if the what you see is what you get and what I say is what I'm thinking and feeling you know that's just who I am take it or leave it whatever um I meant to that. And Glenn got a little bit upset. Glenn got a little bit, bit not upset, but he was a little bit offended by it um, and then sort of walked off and I was like, oh, I, I didn't mean offence by it. I was just, <laughs> I'm just, you asked, I uh, gave yeah. you an answer, you know, and if you didn't like it, I'm really sorry. But I can't remember what release it was, but I just know that there was something in it that I was like, that's just crap. It's not, it's not what I was used to. That's why mm. I thought it was crap. It wasn't crap. It was an amazing release and it probably still – the, the, that was a pivoting point in the program where it changed to evolve into what it is to. But back then, I didn't want the evolution. Get back to where it was. I want what I'm mm. used to, thank you very much. And that was that was very, I'll say naive on my behalf, but also very young, you know. take Let's go <clears throat> 2010, so that's, what are we, are 12, 13 years ago. You know, mm. I was a very different person back then as well that, you know, I didn't think of other people's feelings. I was very much, well, this is what I think, so, you know, that's what it is. This is the Group X Podcast. Yeah, it's just the programs have evolved. I think we've all evolved over time as well. And, and um, yeah, we are where we're at. So, anyway, I think I digress there a little bit, but we'll try and bring it, okay. bring it bring it back on. <laughs> so, track four, you've got up there, you've done it all. Did you pass or did you pass to shadow? Passed, what was yep. it? Yeah, you passed. Well done. I passed. Yep, 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 yep. All good. Beautiful. Um, I got I got all my little my little ticks here and my little feedback so yeah no it was all good um uh, did really did really well actually so how did the worksmith um, go with giving you feedback Mr Smith how did he uh, how was your feedback when you got it from him how did he deliver it oh my god oh. now you're asking me to go back um, <laughs> I look honestly I I'm not gonna lie I can't really remember yep um. I am taking you back 15 years ago, so it's okay. Yeah, yeah um, I just remember he was he was great, you know, yep. um, and I think that's what I loved about it, and, and I think that's what 
everybody loves about Lee. You know, he makes you feel valued and appreciated and, um, you know, that your skill set is important. Yeah. And I think even if I had failed, I probably still would have felt great, but however yeah. he delivered it, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, but I just remember thinking, you know, his positive reinforcement and um, just genuine just genuine care, yeah. you know, that really yeah. sort of came through. Yeah. And I remember feeling really empowered after that weekend, yeah. um, particularly when, you know, I was such a, a young, naive girl who who was stepping into this whole new foreign industry yeah. and um, was quite overwhelmed by it all, you know. Yeah. And he created a safe space yeah. um, that made you feel a part of something really cool, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, so, no, yeah, I think that, I that's brilliant. That's I think that's also a, a, a key, key important thing that needs to happen when we have training is that the the trainer or the facilitator needs to make sure that everyone in that room feels welcome, feels part of what's going on. You know that is yeah, that helps with the training environment. And I'm I'm so I honestly would say that the majority, if not all, trainers and presenters that are out there have that skill set to be able to. Make everyone feel inclusive. You know, let, let's talk about Lesmos Live in Melbourne the other weekend. Uh, absolutely amazing experience. And from the moment that people walked into that room, before the trainers and presenters had said anything, they felt welcome. Yeah, mm. They walked in there, they jumped on the bike, the excitement, the energy was there. As soon as they pressed play and that music started, everyone was, you know, yeah, and yes, okay, we're all trainers and presenters, and especially on the Saturday down there, it wasn't open to the public. They were just um, instructors or, or trainers that are in the room. So it was very much our industry, our environment and our energy from instructors, which was brilliant to see. And I think we have that as, a, as an industry, as Group X in the industry, we have that capability to we have that inclusivity. We make everyone feel at home and welcome in that space. You know, you can be an instructor that's just done training two weeks ago to someone that's done training 20 odd years ago. Doesn't matter. You still have that skill set to make people feel part of the family and, and welcome in that way. And I think that's a, you said that was one thing that Lee's done well. And I'd say that you probably do that in your classes as well. From the moment you walk in the room, the people that are coming through as well know what to expect and they know they feel part of it. No one ever feels left out in any way. Yeah. I think a lot of that is, you know, it does come either naturally or you'd also sort of uh, expand on those skills through the different types of training that Les Mills offers now. Yeah. You know, I think advanced yeah. training has been one of the um, – probably one of the most rewarding types of training that has been brought out because it's, you know, it hasn't just been based around – what we do and how we're supposed to do it and, and the language and all that. It's yeah. really about you, you yeah. as a person, you know, and not just an instructor as a person and how you bring that into your classes. Yeah. And I know that having done that, you know, I did sprint first uh, a few years ago and then when I came onto the team for presenting, um, I did it again for RPM and it was completely different uh, how each training was approached, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, and I learned so much about myself through both of them separately yep. Yep. and how a lot of had changed yeah. and my disc profile was completely was yeah. completely different yep. and I, it blew my mind. I was like, wow, okay. Yep. And that's not just because of that, the training that's, that's me as a person yeah. and how I've evolved over time and how I've, the work I've done on me personally, yeah. you know, yeah. and that's transcended into, into my classes and my coaching and everything. Yeah. Hey, can we, if you don't mind, I want to have, have a quick chat about, <laughs> about um, AIM, Training and that kind of stuff. Do you facilitate mm -hmm. AIM one and AIM two at the moment? No, is no, it no. AIM? No. no, you're not facilitating. Yeah, so that that that's that. I mean, that's all gone, right? AIM one and AIM two that that was uh, dropped off. Okay. So now it's you initial module training, and then you go into advanced training. That's it. Okay, right. Yep. So there I am so out of the loop. That, that, <laughs> yeah. So that's how it's evolved with the, with yeah. the because the, the, the IMTs these days is. Uh, so much more involved yeah. and elaborate. It's, it's a three day yep. process, whereas back then, you know, I think we had. It was two days, yeah. and then you could have however long to do your 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 video submission yeah. to then get to then get TikTok, you know. Yeah. And in between all that, you could be teaching and all the rest of it. So it was very yeah. different back then. Yeah. Um. But so, whereas now the process is very smooth and streamlined. You know, you do your training, you've got your eight weeks, and then you go in for your day three, and yeah. it's you pass or you don't. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So the day um, three, think, the day three training these days then is 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 just about you presenting and honing in on those 
presenting skills. Is that would that be correct? Correct. So it's, it's taken what you've learned from your initial module training, and look, I don't don't, don't quote me because I'm I'm not sort of um, training that, but yep. from what I know, that's what you do. And then so day three is your what you've taken from your feedback and IMT, yep. and it's honing down on that yep. and um, presenting from everything that you've learned and all the feedback you've got, and yep. then yeah, so you either make it through or yep. or you're withheld to then sort of try again. Yeah. Oh, cool. Okay, so you RPM was your first. Then obviously you did uh, you did sprint training. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Have you trained in any other programs, or is just the those two uh, at this so stage? So I'm 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 the bark girl. So I just do yep. bark. So trip as well. So yep. yeah. Cool. Okay. Yep. Out of those three, which is your favourite? I know we shouldn't have a favourite. It's like trying oh, to choose your favourite child. But which would I be your favourite? Put on the spot with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you know I asked myself this question, and it's so hard because. You know, RPM was my baby. It was it, it yep. was where my journey started, yeah. and it is. I love everything about that program. Um, you know, it's what drew me into it. It was the just everything, everything yep. about it. And then I got introduced to Sprint, um, which is which is another story. Like it was just a sort of I'm annoying. Do I do I, don't I? All the rest of it. So. And now I've been involved in that because I've had a little bit more opportunity when it comes to sprint with presenting. Yep. Um, you know, I didn't just get onto the team. There was another process that I had to go through through being on the squad and, and, and you know, that was yes. yeah, yep. a big step. So um, I've had a lot more opportunity to, to, to connect to this program yes. and really uh, highlight it in many different ways. I can't look. I can't actually say which is my favorite because I could do sprint one day and think, you know, or present it or whatever, and go, "This is just the most amazing thing. It's incredible. I love everything about it." And then I'll go do RPM and say exactly the same thing. Yeah. Yep. You know, and then trip is a whole different ball game. I mean, I don't present that, so it's different. But it's yep. then you've got this whole different dynamic uh, uh, that you're coaching with. You yeah. know, it's not no. just you coaching to people. So I that's what's so different. Yeah, I appreciate you know? what you're saying um, there because each of those programs is different and unique in their own way. That yeah, while they're all on a bike, they're not the same. They are no. very different. They're different training modalities. They're different things that are happening, different experiences. And, and I did put you on the spot by asking that, but I'm also grateful that you answered it in the way you did because it's it shows you as a person and your your unique, um, not unique, your... Uh, oh, no, unique is good because okay. <laughs> it's so quirky, weird. Let's just go with unique. Um, okay. I own it. <laughs> I love that. Okay, we'll go with unique then. Your, your unique personality, yeah? Your, but I think that at the same time when I say that, I think because I've done training in sprint, but I haven't done trip. I started in RPM because I'm the bike guy as well. You know, I love everything I was doing on the bike and that's where it all began for me. When I did sprint, I did it very late in my career and almost at the end of when I stopped teaching. But I still found another passion for it because it was different. It was on the bike. It was on that machine that I love. Yep, body bike plug. But I, I at the yeah. same t- <laughs> at the same time, it was it was different because it was a different modality of training that I'd done mm. previously. Uh, so it's it's a, a favorite but in a different way because it gives me a different result with that. You know, I've only ever ridden a trip once and would love to get into it more. However, there's none down here where I live at the moment, so I need to wait for quarterly workshops and be able to go and, and get in to do them. But I, I I appreciate that your answer on it because it's as you said, it's it's yeah, they're all favourites for all different reasons. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, I probably am seen more as the sprint phase because that's what's out there a lot at the moment, yep. you know, but RPM is still very much in my heart, deep in my heart. And I, I actually teach more RPMs I do than, than sprints. Yep. And, um, I just, I just absolutely just love the program. You know, it's not, sprint is hard. It, it, it's, it's intense and it just, it allows you to bring out that sort of, um, really, uh, um, slightly more, I don't know, you know, abrasive aggressive but also very nurturing and inclusive side whereas yep. rpm has got that different feel where you can just connect really connect to music and then that allows you to connect even more to the to the people you know yep. um and you can really use different tones and and that's again something i've learned over time too is how you use different tracks you know your voice your all of it um i mean you can tell like i just i just love them i love them i love them both i think equally i, I, I couldn't pick you know this is the Group X Podcast. Your first ever class that you taught by yourself. How did it go? 
Um, by myself. Um, gosh. Were you nervous? Well, it must have gone well because I'm still doing yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> true. Yeah, this is true. Tony, come on, ask some, ask some proper questions here, Tony. No. But can you remember no, it at all? Think, yeah, because obviously I would have had to do RPM 40, right? Yeah. Um, so it would have been doing the full release, yep, on my own. Uh, obviously done lots of shadowing and then, you know, Justine and I would share the tracks and then, you know, all the rest of it. Yeah. Um, it was great. I actually, I actually do remember loving the fact that I had the space to myself, finally. Uh, and I wasn't having to actually rely on somebody else and let them teach the cooler tracks or, you know, vice versa. So, and I actually had to, not had to, or for lack of a better word, had control of the room. So it, it was all mine and however it came out was, was me, you know, and if they were loving the class, that was because of me. And they did, you know, they, I brought the energy back then and, um, yeah, well, obviously I still do that too, but I love that feeling. I love that feeling knowing that, they were enjoying it, like loving the workout because of how I was coaching it. Have you got a favorite release for RPM? Why do you ask me these questions? Because I want to test you. <laughs> when I'm talking about favorite things, it's just like, no. <laughs> um, oh, my gosh. Is there a track that you you gel with more than others that you play time and time again? Like, is there a oh, track that you go back lot. to? Look, there's quite, yeah, look, there's quite a few. Um definitely the older releases yep. uh you know sort of going back to the older ones there's some really cool cool stuff in some of the newer newer uh you know from from i guess the 70s and up but but way back between the 40s and 60s there's just so much cool stuff a lot yep. of cool stuff in there uh actually just the other day i taught um what was it? Track five, Run to Paradise. Uh, I hadn't done that. I actually hadn't yep. done that in years. Yep. And um, I just, yeah, I just brought back some really cool old stuff. And I was yep. just like, wow. I th- Actually, I think I did RPM 69 in its entirety. That's yep. right. Yep. Yeah. And what a brilliant release. And I thought, wow, this is really cool. I mean, some of the tracks in there I do do quite often. Yeah. Um, but I just, just, just doing the whole one and just even doing that track seven, I was just like, wow, this is so cool. But yeah, I definitely say that it's <laughs> send me an angel. One of my favorites, yep. uh, track seven from, yep. from back then, um, blade as well. Yes. Another really super cool track seven. Yeah. This is all the track sevens. Um, where did you say with blade? Cause blade was originally done in, uh, Oh, I'm going to say RPM 15, um, track seven oh, in really? RPM 15 way back then. And I prefer that release that version, I should say, compared to okay. the latest one. It was just a little bit more, took me back to my dance days. Yeah, it took me back to clubbing yeah. days when it was. And it was, it was, um, I believe it was virtually the version that was used on the movie as well. Okay. So yes. it was, yeah, just sort of gelled with me a little bit more back then. My, 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 my favourite though, because um, it was so damn hard, was Clocks by Coldplay. Oh, yes. It was such a, a unique track in you really had to listen to where the change was in order to get it. And the position from racing into climbing, you really had to nail it properly with the amount of resistance you had in order to change, to get up on the beat, to then move again. I can't remember I what release it was. I don't but, even know what that is. Sorry. To, uh, like I know, obviously I know what the track is. I yeah. love that track. But it, I had no, had no idea. It was yeah, so a track four and, and, and I'm probably going to say somewhere in the 30s. I cannot remember to save my life, but I'm sure our listeners will, will know and be able to find it somewhere. But yeah, just a, a unique, unique track to use as a track four um, that just really gelled. And I think was once you nailed it, the workout was just brilliant as well. There you go, track four, like what you were saying before. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, one of those ones. So, one of those ones. <laughs> yeah. Hey, um, with relation to presenting and training, now uh, we'll talk about pr- the presenting side of things first up. Before you get up on stage, what do you do? Have you got something unique that you do prior to getting up? And presenting that gets you in your zone and allows you to find calm before. Well, that's pretty much what I try and do is tell myself to calm my farm. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> just cause, you know, the adrenaline's going and it's pumping and it's, you've just got everything going through your head. Yep. Um, the anxiety, the nervousness, you know, it, it's just, it's, yeah, it, it can be quite overwhelming. Yep. Um, and it's really, and it's funny because I actually just had a, a brief chat uh, with Sam about this after the e-workshops last weekend because yes. um, I felt myself getting caught up a little bit in my head. 
and um, I just felt like I didn't quite deliver what I wanted to yep. on the day. Yep. And, you know, we know, and like Dallas said, you know, not, not every presentation is going to be your best, you know, and um, I think what I need to remember and what we all need to remember and what we took away from that training at Les Mills, not training, but the little info ed session before the Les Mills Live started um, is remembering we don't always need to tick all the boxes. Yeah. You know, we get so caught up being where we are and what we want to deliver and that we feel like we have to do X, Y, Z every single time. And, you know, I'm a bit of a perfectionist and I do set high standards for myself. And if I don't meet those standards, I feel I've let myself down. Yep. Um, so it's it's having that, you know, conversation with yourself, knowing and trusting that what will be delivered is what you need to do on the day. Yeah. Sure, it may need a bit of um, refinement or adjustment or, you know, but you take away from that and you take it on board for next time. Yeah. Um, so it's just, it's really just going, you know what? You've got this. You know what you're doing. Uh, you will do it as you need to do it. Yeah. And um, yeah. people are there to to enjoy the experience. And you know, because at the end of the day, this industry can be quite cutthroat. And you, it is. There's a lot of scrutiny. Yeah. Uh, it comes with a lot of judgment and and finger pointing and all sorts of things. We know this. Yeah. You know. So you're only as good as your last class presentation yeah. whatever it is yeah. and sometimes we can get caught up in that too and yeah. go oh my god you know okay yeah. that wasn't great so shit what's going to happen now yeah. you know am i not good enough or you know um and it's just constant it's it's, it's negative self-talk but we all do it so yeah. it's just remembering to keep that positive reinforcement and knowing that we are where we are for a reason yeah and um you know do do the best that you can and and learn from it yeah no, I, I, even doing podcasts, there's there's uh, there's self doubt in every really every every episode that I record. Yeah, sending it out there, but it it's staying. I just keep saying to myself, stay in my lane. You do you. You know, haters gonna hate no matter what. You know, just do get on with it, do it. There's uh, there's so many people out there that appreciate what we do, uh, whether it's me doing podcasts or you when you're teaching and doing doing your presenting and that kind of stuff. We are always going to be our own worst critics and think, oh no, mm. I could have done that better. Mm. But everyone looks at it differently. Yeah, so many people will take away so much more than probably what we will ever realise from it. You know, their their Lesmos live the other weekend. I refer back to that because it's the freshest thing in my mind. The amount of instructors, or even on the Sunday, the amount of people that were there, while they were there for the new music, they were there for the release, of everything. They could have been there for so many other reasons. You know, the same as mm. when people come into our classes, we think they're yeah, they're just there for a workout. Man, they could be there for a multitude of reasons and the fact that they're mm. just there is the biggest thing. They're there for whatever their reason is, but they're there instead of somewhere else. They're there making making an effort and doing their thing. We love it because there's people in our class and we think, yeah, this is fantastic, but we really deep down, you have no idea why someone's in your class. Yeah, no, it's, no, But that's it's, right. it's so powerful to know that, hey, they turn up and we're making a difference for them. Yeah. Absolutely. And and that's what I appreciate, you know, and especially with when you look at participants who've, you know, I've had some people that I've been training for the last six, seven years, uh, same consistently, you know, whether it's through RPM or sprint or whatever it's been, and they turn up day in and day out or have left and have come back. And it's, you know, yes, it's for the training and all that, but something has got yeah. to there's going to be another reason too, you know? So yeah. it's, you know, uh, it, it's everything that you deliver. And, and and that's what I've learned to appreciate over time is that whatever my weirdness, my quirkiness, my whateverness, uh, it's obviously, you know, um, appreciate it, I yeah. suppose, yeah. you know? And um, yeah, uh, we're still going to have those self-doubts every yeah. now and then, but yeah. Um, yeah, it's just remembering that we are here. This is the Group X Podcast. Let me ask you an interesting one, and I've only just started asking people this recently, but they get to it in their own way, but instead of a direct question. But I'm going to ask you the direct question. So why do you do what you do? <laughs> I had to answer this as well in my training, and I had a, I came up with this really great big paragraph, and now I'm going to sit here and go, um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, you know, why do I do what I do? It's it's everything that 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 we stand for. You know, this is not just just group exercise. It is it's it's the passion that we have for what we do. It's spreading 
the Les Mills love, but through through a whole different platform of um, you know, it's not just the exercise; it's the connection. It's the it's the you see, I'm putting on, I've been put on the spot, so it's so hard to sort of articulate because it's no. all here and it's all what I feel. Yeah, and sometimes that, it's hard to actually no, get that, all those words out. That is exactly it, though. Yeah. It's here and it's here. When I say here and here, we're, we're um, Jackie and I are pointing to our heads, so our mind yeah. and our heart. Yeah, and that's that's why you do what you do. Yeah, it's not. Sometimes we don't need to actually articulate that in words, but it comes from certain places there, yeah. where you. Yeah, there's a reason in your mind why you're doing what you're doing. It's that connection, whether it's from here and here or here and both. That's why we do what we do. We know we're connecting with the people in front of us. On many, mm. many reasons. There can be just, there doesn't need to be one reason why and go, you know what? Yep, yeah, because I want to make people fitter. Woohoo! <laughs> it's not just that. You're connecting with no. people and making such an impact uh, on people. So I get, I get when you say that. There's, it's, it's, it's a tough question to answer because I put you on the spot completely. I didn't give you any preparation to answer that question. And I did that on purpose yeah. to get the yeah. raw, authentic response from you. Yeah. It's, it's, it's do. And when I can do this, when I, when you can feel right, you know, it's yeah. in your head and it's in your heart and it's in your gut. It's just, you know, and you trust everything that you're feeling because of all that, you know, and it's what I've loved about, um, my teaching over the years is that I've really created communities wherever I go. And in all the gyms that I teach, they've all got little groups uh we've all become really good friends i've met my best friends yep. doing what i do you know they've been my participants still are and and this is what i love it's not it, it, yeah it's not it's like you say it's not just about getting fitter it's, yeah. it's it's so much bigger than that you know some people just come to have fun some people just want to the social side of it and it doesn't matter what age group it is you know i've had really young participants right up until in fact my demographic now is probably between 30 and 50 to yep. be honest with most of my and that's sprint inclusive. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and in every single group that I have, we all know each other, yep. you know, whether it's by name or even more personally yeah. and without even trying, I've helped create that. And I'm, yep. I'm really proud of that. Yeah. That community feel, that connection that you get with your group of people, then doesn't matter which club you're at as well. They can be different from club to club as well. If you're teaching at multiple clubs is a unique thing that us as instructors and trainers presenters, uh, it's, it's what we, we build without really realizing we're building it, but then once you realize you've got it, it's it's a it's something that you never you never lose. You never lose. They're, mm. they're always going to be there. Those people that you've impacted their lives for whatever reason. They've gelled with you for whatever reason it may be. They love coming to your classes and building that community. For some, is a struggle. Yeah, is a big big struggle, a big big challenge. I I've posted recently on uh, the group Exercise Instructors Australia Facebook group and asking instructors questions around, you know, what, why do you work at certain clubs? And, you know, there's going to be some more questions around that sort of topic coming through recently. But a lot of a lot of instructors, and I've seen some comments in there saying, oh, from instructors, you know, it's not my responsibility to grow numbers in classes. Oh. Now, I, I, it's not that I have an issue with that, but I, I'm going to delve into more in that. And I'll ask you as well, who, whose responsibility is it to – to build numbers in classes? Is it just the instructor or is it the club as well? Or is it the community? Because I honestly, I believe that it's more than just the instructor. It's more than just the club. Mm. It involves the people that are in the class as well. There's a, Mm -hmm. that, that there's no one direct answer. You know, I think an instructor plays a role. Instructor has to make sure that they're on fire. They're doing everything correct in that position up on stage, teaching whatever format, whatever program it is. Mm. The club needs to be making sure that they're advertising. So the group fitness manager or group X manager, I should say, needs to make sure that they're doing their thing correctly as well as the club manager mm. or the club owner. You can't just say your responsibility, your instructor go. You know, there's more to it. The members in that class, if they're loving it, they're going to bring their friends. Well, and, and you know what? And I'll, I'll jump in there because I've witnessed this firsthand and um, – you know, I won't sort of go into to, to mentioning names, but having worked at a particular gym where it's changed hands so many times, you know, from South Pacific to Fitness First to whatever, and is now a completely independent chain. And um, they sort of weren't, and, and he, he will even admit saying he had no idea about group fitness or what it sort of really entailed, you know, yeah. but that wasn't his, his background uh, when he came into and, and bought this gym. Um, so group fitness wasn't 
give it as much attention yep. uh, as, as, as say the main gyms or, you know, um, chains would be given. So it, it's been a bit of a process and that's down to being the, the group fitness manager working with them and, and, and us as well to, to really um, spread that message that group fitness is yeah. huge and actually the gym thrives on it, thrives yeah. on it, yeah. um, which they are very much aware of now, you know, but it is, it's an understanding between from up here and I'm pointing up here because I'm saying it's from the top of the chain yes. down to where we are. Yeah. And it's very much a chain reaction. You yeah. know, uh, we've got to be able to work together and yeah, especially when it comes to independent gyms, it's, it's, they uh, don't always know what, what, what's entailed when it comes to group fitness and it's a bit of a foreign um, yeah. concept to them. Yep. So yep. you're right. I think once you get thrown into it and go, wow, okay, this is actually, this is, this is what's keeping this gym going, you yeah. know, this is what people are thriving on. Yeah. Group X has the power to actually uh, service more members in your facility than anything else that's in there. In one space, yes, okay, it might be a big space, but the amount of people you can get in there for an hour period um, and the cost is so low for what you're mm. doing for that one class. I think that's a, mm -hmm. the biggest disconnect or the biggest thing that I think the industry needs to understand is the power that Group X has. And the, and coming from, uh, as you said, that you know, if someone walks into open a gym or, or is running a gym or comes to purchase a gym or however that happens, if they don't have the understanding of Group Exercise, then they really don't get it at all you know mm. they they can they can just have a gym where it's just weightlifting and that's fantastic if that's just their core but if they've got a gym or they they acquire a gym that has group exercise they need to know that the power it has is huge yeah we as instructors we as in managers need to be able to pass that through to them and let them know the amount of people we can actually service and what it does it's a yes it's a cost center but it's a retention tool it's the biggest retention mm. tool we actually have when it's done correctly yeah yeah the, uh, it's, it's really what keeps 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 um, communities alive too, yeah, you know. Yeah. Uh, with this particular place, I, I as I said, I've been in there for I think, oh gosh, probably about seven eight years now, yeah. and um, still have the same members. And yeah. the only reason I have stayed there because there's been a lot of political issues, yeah. you know, as you do through transitions, yes. uh, change of hands, all the rest of it. And there's yeah, there's been a lot, and I could quite easily have left, like a lot of people did, but yeah. I stayed because yeah. of the people. Yeah. You know, and that's what mattered most to me. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, whether whether the owner of that centre realises or not, you're part of the reason why those members are still there. Are you mm. hanging around? Yeah. You could have, as you said, you could have got up and walked away. Now, I don't even know what club you're referring to, but it doesn't matter. It's more mm. the, the, the fact that you have stayed there through thick and thin and done it. Those members have appreciated it. Those members mm. are paying members that have stuck around. They could have gone elsewhere too. You know, yep, if you if you'd absolutely. gone to a club down the road, they could have followed you. But the fact that you decided to stay one for them is also you decided to stay for the club as well. You know, yes, for there may be reasons that it's closer for you to get to than any other gym or whatever that may be, but the club needs to realise as well that the power you have by staying there has helped that club survive and do their thing. So it's it's yeah. that that power that group exercise has, again, as we're referring to. This is the Group X Podcast. What are you full time industry or do you do something else as well? Yep, yep. So, um, so yeah, very much. Um, you know, the, the the fitness side of things as well. Um, been involved in a lot of different things over time. You know, I've actually, um, you know, I used to own, um, be part owner of a CrossFit box years ago. Okay. Um, I have run obstacle race uh, for for quite some time. Yep. Uh, developed a product for obstacle racing as well, so protection gear. Uh, so yeah, had a few businesses on the go and yep. done a few different things, all around, all revolved around uh, fitness. You know that stuff all sort of came from CrossFit and then moved into different avenues, um, and still going. You know I've got a I've got my my gym set up at home as well, so I still yep. dabble in a bit of the, you know the PT side of things every now and then. But because my shift to group fitness has um, or group exercise has really taken over it's um it's what i it's really what i thrive on yep. um you know we've got other things that i do on the side as well when it comes to to, to business but it's sort of unfitness related yep. um yep. so that's sort of i just kind of keep separate and because i'm also looking at to uh expand in a slightly different way yep. um yep. which is going to come down to 
a lot of empowerment. So I won't yeah. go too much into now because I don't like to sort of, you know, put it out there when it's not set in stone yeah. or sort of give away too much. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, there is change on the horizon. Cool. Watch this space, people. Watch this yep. space. Yep. I like that. Yep. It's, it's, uh, you've, you've given us a little taster without going too far. But, um, look, I appreciate I appreciate you answering that question and being honest with us as well. So thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, Another couple of questions. What is there anything in, in the group exercise space that you think needs to change? That needs to change. Yeah. Um, that we're doing that we should be doing differently. Now that yes, it's a personal question and yes, it's you know, there's there's a it's opinion based because everyone has an opinion. But I'm just be interested. Is there anything that you see that that as group exercise in our industry we should be looking at doing differently? And if not, that's okay. Uh, Oh, look, I'm sure there is things, you know. Um, there's probably quite a few things, but it's just a thing. I think the appreciation of what we do can sometimes be overlooked. Um, and it's kind of like what I spoke about before as well with, you know, talking about group exercise and how important it is and, and gyms actually realising and valuing what we do, you know, whether that's um, whether that's just acknowledging what we do through words or, you know, <laughs> the dollar signs as well, because that can be quite a competitive thing as well, you know, when it comes to to doing what we do. And I think, you know, we are undervalued financially from a, from, from that respect. Yeah. Um, and just, I think what needs to be done as well is just really actually look at what we are doing and, and getting everybody involved and making sure that, you know, the standards are the same across the board. Yes. Um, because it's, you know, we can be going out there and saying we, we stand for this or Les Mills, this or this, but the standard may not be the same or, you know, people are sort of taking things into their, into their, um, doing things their way, let's yep. say, yep. you know, <clears throat> which may not totally. necessarily be the correct way. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I think looking into what we're doing as a whole and just um, setting the standards. The, oh my god, I'm going to get lost. No, no. Look, I appreciate what you're saying. No, I appreciate <laughs> what you're saying because it's it's um, the reason why I started Group X. Yeah, because we need to change something in the industry. What that is. I'm not 100 percent sure. I, I do not know. I do not have all the answers. The first one to put my hand up and go. You know what? No, don't know. But I'm happy to chat to people and find out different people's responses and different people's views and opinions. You know, if we shut up and just let the clubs dictate to us what's going on, mm. we're never going to get anywhere. You know, us as instructors, us as trainers, us as group exercise leaders in this space need to be able to find out what is it? What is it that as an instructor we're not delivering? What is it that as an instructor is looking for? And now more than ever, from pre-COVID to now where we are, a lot changed during COVID where instructors would just press pause and were told virtually, you'll come back and teach when I tell you to come back and teach. Mm. You know, if I was a club and said that to an instructor, I wouldn't be surprised if an instructor turned around and gave me the bird and said, you know what? No, nah, I'll go somewhere else. I'll go somewhere else where I'm actually valued and wanted. And I think mm. that's part of what I'm trying to uncover with all of this. And I think the, as an industry as a whole for a group exercise, we need to understand, yes, we need to understand from a club's perspective what they're after and what they're looking for. But we also need to understand from an instructor, why and, and what are you looking for? What are you looking for? What's going to make you really want to come and teach here? You know, yes, yeah, pay is a big thing. But there are discrepancies from a club that has 4,000 members that are just doing group exercise and there's a bucket load of money coming in to a club that has only 300 members doing group exercise and not much coming in to a club that is in a regional area to a club that is in a metro CBD area depending on how much they're actually paying for a membership as well, how much the participant um, pays to become a member of a gym. All those things need to come into play when we work out what we pay an instructor. Mm. But at the same time, there's no governing body in the group exercise space. There's no governing body, there's no union that we're all part of that, that we've sort of said, right, you know, if you're going to be a group exercise instructor, you must join this because this is what's going to happen. There's so much mm. diversity in that. There's so much range. I've seen clubs paying an instructor $25 an hour up to $85 an hour. 
You know, you think, wow, Jesus, what, 25 bucks an hour, are you kidding me? I threw the question out on the Group Exercise Instructors Australia page the other week. I even had someone turn around and say, no, we need to be paid 150 bucks a class. I'm like, wow, okay. Okay. That, that just blows my mind that, that that there's people out there thinking that that's what a, a one-hour class is worth. But that's what we need yeah. to understand in the industry is where are we at? This right now is a time for us to clean the slate, reset, and rebuild what we're doing. We know what we've done before. Yeah, that's fantastic. But there's people out there that haven't had a pay increase for 10 mm. years that are still on $40 a class. Mm. And, that's, and that's, you know, that is a, a really big... Uh, issue and it does need to be addressed because I do believe, you know, a pay scale is absolutely, um, you know, it, it's, it is sort of the right way to look at yeah. things because yeah. we all have skills yep. and those develop over time. And, you know, when you've just come off your IMT, I mean, you know, no, you're not ready to be paid $60 no. an hour because no. you haven't got that skill set yes. yet, yep. you know? Um, and you need to be able to prove that. And, and in, in this industry, you do need to be able to prove to some degree, you're worth yeah. because yep. just being trained is, doesn't mean that you're delivering yep. an A1 100% on point class every single time. And that's okay because yep. even the best of the best don't produce a 100% class every single time. But there are, mm-hmm. you're right in saying there needs to be a pay scale from the moment you walk in after initial, mod, initial module training to someone that's, you know, teaching a class that has been doing it for three to four years and is constantly getting great numbers. And when I say great mm-hmm. numbers, I mean, not your peak time slot where, you know, a monkey could walk in at 5.30 on a Monday night and get 100 people, as an example, if it's studio had 100 people, you'd get, you know, pack, a, pack class every single time. There's a mm. different skill set in teaching that to teaching an off-peak time slot and being able to attract X amount of people in that room at that time. Mm. You know, you need to be paid accordingly for what you're doing. But at the same time, clubs also need to realise that the investment that they're paying it's not just a cost, it's an investment for that instructor and for what they're able to do. But instructors also need to do more than just rock up and teach and walk away again. Yeah, you know, There's both sides of that spectrum. And I think there's that's where I believe that the position description, probably we'll call it that, I haven't looked at that before, position description for a Group X instructor hasn't been defined. No. It's different for class to class. It's different from club to club. Mm. Yeah, we need to narrow it in a little bit to this is, you know, this is virtually the the non-negotiables or these are the basics that we're expecting for you as a Group X instructor in a club. If you're not ticking these boxes, you can't expect to be getting paid top mm. dollar. And look, that was that was a, um, th- there was a, a scheme on that. I know with Fitness First, um, they introduced that process of uh, being um, assessed I think it was every, I can't remember how often it was, six months maybe. Yep. And that's when they would look at, you know, your your GFM would then tick off all these boxes uh, and then your pay rate would then be considered to be increased and it was literally like a dollar or yep. two yep. Uh, increase. So, yes. yes, that may sound like nothing, but I guess at least it was something. But yep. it also gave the system a process to approach to then look at what was what was going on in the clubs. Yep. You know, because 100%. most of the time the GFMs don't even know what's going on and then they wonder why classes aren't working or why they're on building up and you know yeah a lot of it does come down to it's it's us you know yeah um so i think if they if they reintroduce something like that now especially now post post covid you know everything is sort of coming back to a more normal state uh classes are picking up and people are going to want initially it was just like oh it's great to be back and yes you know i just want to do a class but now we're coming back to a place where the standards need to come back 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 up as well and um a system needs to be put into place that we are making sure that people are getting what they pay for yeah, essentially completely and um and that we get paid what we should be getting paid as yeah. well you yeah. know if we are meeting those standards and ticking those boxes yeah i think a lot of it and and this is not pointing the finger at group x managers but i believe a lot of it comes back down to a group x manager having the right skill set to be able to assess not just guess yeah, they need to need to be doing more than just finding covers, updating the timetable, to, you know, doing pays, whatever it may be, entering numbers into a spreadsheet. That to me is only really a very small percentage of what the role is. The bigger mm. part is is building that community with your instructors, building that community with your members, showing the group 
uh, sort of the owner or the, the, the club manager, uh, the power the group exercise has, but also having the confidence and having the skill set to walk into a room and assess trainers and presenters, assess any instructor that's in there, whether they're at that level or not, but they need to have the skill set to be able to walk in. It could be a program that, as an example, I, I've never done yoga or Pilates, but if I was a group X manager, I'd want to have the skill set to be able to walk in and actually assess that person, not on their movement, not on all that kind of stuff. Cause Hey, I don't know the program. I haven't done 200 hours worth of yoga training to understand what goes into it, but have mm. the skill set to be able to walk in there and see how that instructor or how that trainer or how that presenter is actually delivering, give them some feedback, but also be able to assess them to go, yeah, cool. You know what? This was fantastic. This I think you should work on, but it also mm. comes back down to us as trainers or instructors in the class to allow that to happen. We're not king of the mm. king of the, you know, King of the kids here. We, there's everyone can can take on some form of feedback. Everyone can take on criticism in some way, if mm. they allow it to happen. You know, I remember back in the day when I was Group X manager at North Sydney Fitness First, there were instructors training for me that were Les Mills presenters, international trainers and presenters that I had to give feedback on. Yeah, a lot of them were like Tony, you, you, how can you give me feedback? Yeah. I'd been in the industry for what felt like two minutes compared to these guys that had yeah. been around forever. Yeah. But it was that that opportunity that I was given to look at those skills that I had from, you know, telco days and everything else that I was doing and bringing those life skills to be able to sit down and look at a trainer and presenter and go, okay, you know what? Yeah, cool. You did this really, really well. Have you thought Mm -hmm. of doing this? Not that was crap. You shouldn't do it. It's the way that that delivery is done as well. But Mm -hmm. I think that's where, where we will find the change happen is having a group X manager actually have, a different skill set than what they have or be allowing the group X manager to run that department properly. Not just well, to even the, say given the, the, the help and assistance to, to, to be able to do that, you know, yeah. even if it's, if it's a bit of a training, it's just like with us, you know, if we get upskilled into something to something different, whether it's training or whatever it is, we need to learn that, you know, you yep. don't always just have it. Yes. You, you get the tools to learn it. Yep. And if that can then be implemented and, and just, um, brought into the clubs to and just it will show support as well for, yeah. for, for the, the group X instructors too, you know, to have someone who knows how they can help and how they can support, which will then just give us that um that safety, you know, yeah. uh knowing that we are supported. Yeah. The the direction the direction of Group X is heavily led by a Group X manager in the club with the support from the instructors that are there. And if it's not directed from the top, then there's always going to be a struggle, but there's got to be that level of respect both ways from an instructor to a manager in the department to make sure that it's going to be moving in the right direction. I think that's where looking at pay scales and looking at all the things that instructors are looking for, they need to make sure that they are the right fit for the club, but also that the group X manager is a leader, not just a manager. You can manage a shit show, Mm. but if you lead it, you can change it. Yeah, and that's that's what we... um that's what we like to, to look at as well, right? It's being a fitness leader. It's, yeah. it's, it's, and it's really taking that title and, and, and living and breathing it. Yeah. You know, we, we're not just instructors, we're fitness leaders and we need to live by that. This is the Group X Podcast. Last question for you. What sure. bit of advice can you give to any instructor that might be listening that wants to improve on what they're doing or move into a trainer presenter? Roll. Uh, well, first and fir- first, well, first and foremost, I should say, is just be you. You know, that's one of the most valuable things I, I've I've taken away from my journey in group exercise and in general is just to be you. Don't try and be someone else. Don't try and be another presenter on a masterclass or um, you know someone else that you look up to. Because then the day people come for you and it's allowing yourself to be who you are and shine the way you are, that's going to keep drawing people in. Uh, and it's only going to lead you to be your best authentic self uh, and keep trying, you know, don't give up, believe and you will achieve. So it's, you know, I didn't get here overnight and I'm still very much, I'm the newbie, you know, so I'm the new kid on the block and that's still quite overwhelming for me because it's just, Sometimes you still go, oh, you know, like, you know, don't deserve to be here and all these guys, you know, they've been around forever and they just, they're all so amazing. And you know what? Yeah, I do deserve to be here. 
and I've worked my ass off to get here. It's not been an easy process. Where well, like it probably was for some some people way back when when it was just like a matter of okay, I know this person, so I'm in. You know, um, this has been a long journey for me. Fifteen years, right? And I had to go through a process, an application process. I went onto a squad. I then which then disintegrated because of COVID. I had to go through another application process, but I was asked to be a part of that application process to come on board, you know, and there was a lot of work involved, <laughs> a lot of work involved. Um, so, yeah, if you want something, don't give up because anything is possible. And, um, yeah, you've just got to, you've just got to hold that vision and have hope and, and keep doing the work. Thank you. Thank you so much. I um, I appreciate everything you just said. Then that the, I'm lost for words now because, not saying you weren't authentic before that I asked you that question, but what you've just come out with then is 100% you, and exactly what you were just saying then is 100% you be you, and I so so greatly appreciate the fact that you just said what you said, with that as well. That has hit home to me more than anything in re- re- recent days that that is, has, I suppose, cemented something back in me as well to just do you, you be you. Um, people will accept you if they're going to. If they're not, they're not. You know, it's it's just it's be be honest and be truthful to yourself. So, Jackie, thank you so much for, for you being you. Thank you for coming on the show and having a chat with me. I've greatly appreciated it and I'm sure that our listeners will uh, – We'll be able to take more than what we thought possible away from this chat as well. So, we'll, we'll see. No, thank you. Thank you so much, Tony, for having me. I uh, appreciate it. I really enjoyed the chat.